thank you. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to have this panel. Um, I realise we're sort of keeping everyone from your cocktails, so we'll try and keep it interesting, try and keep it snappy and uh, the rest of it. Um, I guess the, the point is just to give a, a, a little flavour of what's coming up in ASCO. Obviously, ASCO started, but uh, you know most of the late breakers and the, the, the big stuff is yet to come. Um, I guess we're going to have a, a, a little chat about what's sort of interesting for everyone, what all the themes are that, that we've all seen. Um, but also the aim is to get input from the audience. So if you if anyone wants to interject or ask a question or tell us we're talking nonsense, please go ahead at any point and, uh, and we'll, we'll do that. I don't know if we have a quick round of introductions or... Yeah, um, I'll just say like Jacob and I put so much work and effort into this that we wore the same jacket today. That's how serious we are about this. Um, but in seriousness, uh, I think this is going to be a really exciting ASCO. ASCO always gets more exciting each year. It sounds like a cliche to say that, but there are so many modality that are working right now. Like think of all of the exciting things that have been happening with ADCs, which feel like they're new, but as we all know, have been in development for decades and decades, but something special is going on right now. The same is true of bi-specifics. We have bi-specifics on the market and they're like dominating the headlines. There was a huge headline yesterday with a bi-specific that everybody's trying to sort out right now. Um, and you have the same thing with radio pharmaceuticals, cell therapy. I mean, there's so many options. And as people in this industry, it's exciting, but it's also a little difficult to sort out because as we'll talk about on our panel today, there's a lot of targets um, and a lot of indications where like companies are throwing every modality at that target. And it's our jobs to figure out like, is there going to be like a winner? And if so, what is it going to be? And I think that's going to, those are some of the, a lot of the things we're going to talk about on the panel. So I'm Brad Loncar. Um, I'm the creator of biotech TV. If you haven't seen it, it's uh, biotechtv.com and we post, uh, video clips on social media like LinkedIn and Twitter and places like that. And the idea is to do like um, like a financial network, um, but only biotech and like interviewing biotech CEOs and researchers and just people that have interesting science. So please check it out if you have a chance and we'll go down the table and uh, somebody who's been a guest on Biotech TV before, Ben, good to see you. Glad to be here. Ben Burnett from uh, Steeple, Equity Research Analyst. Hi, uh, this is Jun Xu. I, I work for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, and we have a venture program called Therapy Acceleration Program, in short, LSTAP. And you can Google it. You can find a lot of information. Hi, Margarita Chavez, a venture partner at Wellington Partners. I'm Max Neeson, a research analyst at Bloomberg Intelligence. Okay, great. Well, I'm just going to dive straight in. I'm going to throw a few sort of big ASCO themes that I've seen. There and maybe we can have a quick discussion. So obviously, to me, this is yet another big farmer ask. We've got some big, big late breaking um, and plenary data sets. Obviously, three big things from AstraZeneca on the Flora, the Adriatic, and the uh, Destiny Resto 6 trial. We've got uh, GSK and Dream 8. Um, we've got some KRAS data from the big farmer players. However, there's also um, some very, very interesting, as Brad says, very interesting uh, sort of biotech uh news that's already moved share price obviously um we most significantly uh, summit uh yesterday um obviously uh, also maris has moved on the uh, on the bi specific data um surprisingly there's quite a bit of cell therapy which i'm sure we'll talk about um and also some some things in in, in synthetic lethality as, a, as an emerging mechanism um so uh i mean that's that's one of my things i don't know if so, Sam, what's sort of interested each of you so far, and uh, any, any of those things you want to pick up on? I'll just just to kick it off. I think um, this will be an interesting meeting for breast cancer. So, I think there's a lot of. Our, you mentioned AstraZeneca has a couple of plenaries, um, which will sort of inform us on in HER2 and, and, and its utility and kind of the, the very ultra low HER2. Um, Lily's going to have some data. This is probably not the most like sexy data, but they're going to have data with their whole vestrant plus a bemisiclib versus. Well, best friend. And whether it's positive or negative, I think that'll kind of tell us, you know, what what is going to be the right control arm that companies should be running and thinking about in sort of second line uh, HR positive for two negative breast cancer. So um, something that could have implications for, for breast cancer drug development. 
So, um, so we are page, sort of like, you know, patient driven advocacy. So, um, my focus definitely is the human space. And then it says, uh, we are doing the VC early stage. So I pay more attention to really the posters in terms of cell therapy. And, you know, I, Caribou, you know, has a poster on the aloe. Um, like we did this Zoma one trial. So after this, uh, this CAR T cell, so we really want to focus on the things off the shelf. So I really looking forward. Uh, to to see all this data for the animal uh, cell therapy. Yeah, so you know, as an early stage investor, I think what I, what I really look for is like what's been validated because it's probably too late for us already. So um, you know, so it's really about for me what what what's new like synthet- synthetic lethality, for example. Right? There's new data coming out in on Paul Theta, which is you know, I'm not sure how new synthetic lethality really is but it's coming back right? it's back in the way i guess um same goes for um radiotherapy uh you know i think for the longest time people were doubtful uh, that anything would come of it but you know that data is going to be interesting um and adcs as well you've know, been looking at adcs for a long time the first deal that um abbott fd did was over 10 years ago with cgen um and it's now coming to fruition now and now everyone is doing it and wants to do it and i think for a ve- early stage venture investor like like us, I think it'll be hard to now go into um, any of those areas. And then the question is, so where do you go? Right? It's like super competitive. Even the novel target space is super competitive. And so, is it maybe too late to go into oncology for early stage investors? I I don't know. Um, it's a question. I'm not making a statement here. Um, it could be totally controversial. Um, and you can see it. I think. With a lot of the biotechs now switching from, uh, and you know, I think ten years ago we saw a lot of oncology companies switching into immunology, uh, immunology companies switching, switching into oncology, and that's the flip side now. So that's a long way of saying I want to see what's going on and what's getting validated and see where else we can play. Um, you know, too many things to list, but uh, a couple things I'm looking forward to. I'm always looking for what are the the sort of data sets that we're gonna really shift maybe how practice or a market is going to look, you know, maybe even five years down the line. Um, one of those I'm looking forward to is sort of the for- one of the forgotten plenaries, I guess, which is uh, Nadida and melanoma. So that's, um, you know, neoarpage I and mean, uh, hippie nevo, um, you know, something that already a lot of interest in when you got that that um, cooperative group study for pembrolimide therapy. But this is looking, you know, at a combination and whether you can potentially sort of emit that, that uh, adjuvant treatment after surgery um you know again broader theme going to see a lot of exploration of that um you know lung cancer as well for example um moving uh ADCs earlier in breast cancer so a little bit more destiny breast to six um just both things that you know in two different tumor types and in ways that will extend beyond that as you look at both those assets and and those approaches extend beyond them so um looking really forward to those data sets and uh, discussing how those turn out Um, I'll throw something out for the panel. Bispecifics. I'm wondering if anyone has any opinions about bispecifics beyond CD3s. You know, especially in light of like yesterday's news, which was a PD1 by VEGF. Um, are we going to see a lot more of that? And is there a clear answer yet on for like those types? Like, say it's like a PD1 by CTLA4. Do we have any evidence yet? if a bispecific approach is equal to or better than using two separate drugs that also hit the same target? Uh, I mean, this is something that I've, I've really wanted a great answer to. I mean, we, we have a lot of data, but not big trials, not much head-to-head. I mean, only to think about is full rest to make the AstraZeneca PD-1 c part, running a ton of studies. You know, again, everyone has their their pet theory about you know, whatever combination of two things, whatever, I mean, that's the affinity, it's going to do something different. But until you get sort of a really big, robust study that, that's that's looking at that question in, in different tumor types that, that really test it rigorously, I, I don't think we quite have that answer yet. And I think that's why you have sort of this eye of the polder effect with, with this data we just saw in that PD1 like, bed jack, and that'll continue for some time, I think. Ben, do you have any opinion on that? Because we also have like mirrors especially from a stock market perspective is like one of the more high profile companies today. And, you know, it's the same, same 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think we, I think we should see that. I mean, I think we, we should see sort of an exploration beyond the CD3 um, kind of universe. Um, you know, what's interesting, just kind of hitting on Summit in particular, when there's when there's two drugs where you have sort of like a known C profile, so VEGF one, there's sort of a clear bar that, that emerges. And we saw this with Summit where they had their ASCO abstract, and the stock actually took a pretty big uh, hit on that because I think it didn't meet the you know, whatever the expectations were when you think about, I think or I think the expectations were VEGF plus Pembro. Do you see something more like synergistic or is it just additive? And so the stock took a big hit on that. And obviously we had, you know, maybe some bailout by their, their Chinese uh, partners that showed some superiority data over Pembro. But the, I guess the, the one, you know, the one thing I think companies have to think about going beyond sort of the CD3 when they're looking at two validated targets is what is the expectation and then what's the likelihood that you can be that expectation? Because if you don't, it impacts kind of the ability to access capital, fair or not. And I think in some case, it was not fair. And um, how do we feel about like staying with buy specifics, but really broadening to more modalities for some of these indications and some of these targets where we have like auditing it is a great example. I just had a conversation with Paul Renner about this great example of a target where you have people doing ADC, RTs, antibodies, and by specifics. Do we have like a firm grip yet on what modalities make sense for what are certain cancers going to be or a modality or certain modalities patients? Like where are we in sorting one want to take? I don't think there's a clear answer now, but I think you, your questions are excellent questions and that we, we, we want to figure out too because there's so many things now. And also from patient perspective, what do they get, right? And then there's so many things even first line. And there's no comparison of what's the first line is the best for which patient population. Yeah, and in terms back to by specifics, I think you see a lot more really like startups working on different one beyond CD3. The other thing I want to point out is this other... Uh, other than T cell engager, we have NK cell engager as well. And then we have like other sort of different cell type, like macrophages, myeloid cells. Guess what I've seen, does it not depend on the antigen target you're hitting? Because it, it seems that each antigen sort of seemed to work best in a specific modality. So for instance, C19, I'll hit the big time with RT, having not the straight antibody for rats. Uh, T20 is a bit different uh, at the new CAR T antibodies and now with the T cell engagers it sort of gets in the big times to me it's that, that's I mean I think uh, the question is especially when you're talking about more novel targets that no one really knows that's why you have you know uh, Judson Johnson for example running three different programs against Calc 3 you know radio lag and uh, a CAR T and uh, um, just themselves so it's going to take a lot of interrogation to, to get there. Um, and I think there's probably going to end up being room for a lot more granularity in terms of you might have, you know, multiple assets at the same target that, that do fit different patients based on, you know, patient, whether they want to travel, um, you know, their fitness, um, so that there's going to be more, and even, you know, room for multiple assets aimed at the same target. If you think about CD3s with Rush, um, you know, they, they've got two different ones for, um, for lymphoma. So, um, I think that's going to be something you'll see more of. How do you develop that? Um, how do you how do you yeah. sort of prosecute? Yeah, that exactly. That that's something I very much do. I mean, I don't think anyone has that. Yeah, yet. I think we have the benefit of having all these, you know, novel these novel technologies, novel modalities, and the ability to strata, so you can really target, like, you know, at, at a genetic level, um, you know, specific drugs, specific patients, and it's good for the patient. But then from a drug development, right, how do you do it? Context so. I mean, I get to IRA, um, and you know how 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 do you do it in, in a way that we're, we're enabling to continue to innovate? So, I think it's more of a method. I feel like um, one question we always ask on this panel, like year over year, is the overcrowding question. You know, like if we we're this was like ten years ago, we'd be talking about like a hundred PD ones. Then we'd be talking about all the CD19 cars, and then we'd be talking about all the BCMA programs. How are we today? Has that problem gotten better, 
or worse? And does anyone have a brilliant solution <laughs> to, you know, for that not to happen as an industry going forward? I, I think some of this is sort of dictated by strategic. We had a panel, I think the first panel this morning was around deal making. And what they told us was that the probability of success is higher when targets are valid. You know, and there's also some discussion. I think there, you know, the other side of that is, well, you want to see differentiation too, because you want the probability of success commercially to not go down if you have some that's not best in class. And so I I think I think it's it's sort of both sides. I think um I think you're going to see just given the validation that like one, you know, as soon as someone I maybe we'll see a bunch of PD one veg out by specifics emerge post this uh post this uh, CASO data. I think I think you'll see people look at the P the POS clinically going up, therefore investment dollars near term can achieve some success and some growth. Um, but ultimately I think you do have to think about like, okay, how 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 will you uh, differentiate your safety, convenience, whatever? Um, I still think efficacy matters the most really to really de risk the commercial side of that. I, I, to your point, I think with strategics, you can see now um, that some of the strategics are looking earlier with smaller deals. Like you do a hundred million dollar upfront for a collaboration in an early stage, maybe development candidate, maybe pre DC unvalidated platform. Um, but you know, with one potential molecule that has some in vivo proof of concept that you can help develop and take into the clinic and maybe into market. Um, but in large part. Yeah, it is usually going to be about the validated targets. And I don't know how you avoid overcrowding if you keep focusing on validated platforms and validated targets. I think the solution will be, you know, you have to invest in early stage unvalidated platforms, even with like small volumes, you know. Then I think that's what we try to do in Chicago. It's just like a uh, selfish kind of plug. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of novel modality going on, novel we're going in Chicago, drug and drug world which is actually very relevant in an overcrowded space because we know what are validated targets. A lot of them, well, I mean, I didn't, shouldn't say it's correctly validated. MIT, for example, it's undruggable. But a lot of people are working on it, and there's a lot of drugging the undruggable work here that I think has gotten some traction in uh, targets. And, of course, this is ASCO, but I think the latest example solved the self-therapy companies announcing autoimmune programs, especially <laughs> CDN18. So we'll see how all that plays out. Um, Jacob? Well, I was just going to pick up on that because, I mean, I wonder whether the this this overcrowding of, of, of targets and, and this sort of suggestion of perhaps oncology becoming very difficult to invest in, you know, for, for a number of aspects um, because this overcrowding, whether that in part has fueled this, call it what you will, a, a flight away from oncology, flight towards autoimmune as a sort of, uh, you know, avenue to you, I don't know Somewhere. I mean, the, the thing that I remain perplexed about that flight is maybe um, well, too little consideration of, of sort of the economics and reimbursement of like whether the oncology model of you pay a lot for treatments and there's sort of conditioning and structure and even in fact, in some cases, legal protection built into it that does not necessarily exist in other disease areas. Um, you know, again, that that's a set of questions that may not be answered until we get to sort of a commercial state asset, but um, it is something that in the rush of, you know, the excitement about this data, you're seeing responses and in, in good, good results in sort of heavily refractory patients for assets that people sort of already have. So like, you're like, great, let's go do it, especially when you are also confronting an overcrowding problem in oncology at the same time, you know, makes all the sense in the world if you're a developer to go for it, but you you do have these uh, other potential roadblocks that that maybe haven't been fully considered. So and almost every intake cell company is a movie to immunology. And I think that's a good thing because there's a lot of investment into those companies and then their perspective in oncology probably doesn't look very good after so many years. So I think it's good. So all the investment will be still kind of utilized. Okay. Oh, I reckon that's very key. It's, that's, that's having a, another effect of its own of crowding. Now it runs it, you know, loop with PCMA and CD9 cheap cars. Like, that's overground and it's. But that's the autoimmune industry's problem. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I want to ask you about a couple of modalities that um, 
again, this is such an exciting time. We have a couple of new modalities that have finally crossed the finish line after many, many years of development. So one is TCR-based therapy. So Municor, I think it was about exactly a year ago, had the first TCR engager. Um, Adaptimune has a TCR-based cell therapy in front of FDA right now. And the other one that I'm thinking of is TILS. I feel like we've been talking about TILS for decades. Finally, Iovance is now approved in refractory melanoma. Uh, whenever you have new modalities like that cross the finish line, one of the immediate questions people ask is, are they going to be a niche or are they going to have, is this just going to be the start and is there going to be broader utility and other things? So I'm wondering if any of our panelists have an opinion on, on that question about either or both of those technologies that are now commercial. Yeah, I would say my opinion is, I I think they're not niche. It, it's it interesting, you mentioned, we've been talking about TILS for decades, I and mean, we have. There's been a lot of ups and downs around TILS. Um, but I think iAvance has done something pretty remarkable in terms of trailblazing the regulatory path of TILS. And I, you know, we're seeing now all of a sudden I'm sitting with data at this meeting with next-gen engineered TIL therapy, melanoma, they're also lung cancer, um, Ivance is also talking about a next gen engineer till. So it feels like to me, till is, you know, we've broken through kind of like that tough barrier of, you know, how do you get a drug approved? How do you make something that's a lab product to something that's a commercial product? But now that we've done that, I think we can look at the efficacy, which is meaningful in late line melanoma, but I think results need to be proven. So I think that's sort of the, the carrot that's going to be out there. Not only till, but other solid tumor um, sort of IO salt therapy like pursuits. So I, I think this is this. Anyone else? And then um, just just take the TCR piece for a bit. Um, I think you have the same kind of thing where you know again the Municor can track breaking breaking in. Then you look at how do we make this more broadly applicable. So that comes from another modality, um, you know, salt therapy. Both you can point to um, attack me. You can point to Maddox, which is um, having you know really good results. Um, and then you think about how do you make it broader in terms of, you know, avoid being limited to just one HLA type. Um, I mean, of course, looking at that themselves with uh, Prane, which is their sort of program, they're making a big bet. We'll see more data. Actually, we already saw it. Um, but, uh, you know, they're they're expanding that program a lot. And they're looking at, you know, multiple iterations of the same asset. So just sort of looking at strategies of how do we, um, you know, both get the advantage of, of that sort of program where you could sort of give it up right off the shelf have the cell therapy and in all of which, um, you know, the idea, the sort of fundamental idea of the TCR is that you brought in the array of targets. So um, that is something where, you know, the, that piece of that hasn't been fully realized where you could, you know, sort of make you know, patient specific TCR cell therapies, something that plenty of people are exploring. Um, so all of that is, you know, to come, but it gains momentum when you have that sort of fundamental proof of concept, you'll see more of it. Um, another question that I, I think is interesting to like follow the trend line is the point at which the large pharmaceutical companies buying into new technologies. You've seen that in a massive way with ABCs lately. Obviously, Pfizer buying CGen. You're seeing companies like FB, you know, go in that direction, which traditionally have it with the Elahir acquisition. And you've seen that in a big way also in the radio pharmaceutical sector. I think there were four or five major reading pharmaceutical acquisitions. I'm wondering um, if you could put uh, your forecasting hat on what do you think will be like the next modalities that might receive, you know, major buy-in like those two have in the last three or four years? Maybe the novel by specifics. Anyone else? I'd say in vivo cell therapy, although that's kind of, you know, it's not necessarily the new black. And again, you know, there's a lot of nanoparticle stuff going on in, in Chicago. And it has, you know, tills for a long time. We're like, yeah, nanoparticles are there. I think nanoparticles kind of make their way into the game. Um, I'm particularly interested to see what's going to happen post uh, sort of Moderna's breakthrough in, in the sort of personalized cancer vaccine space. Although I, I feel like that's one where, um, you know, the, you're, you're starting to run into the fundamental difficulty of it. And, you know, it's like Moderna talking, knocking back the timeline for filing on melanoma. First, it was recruiting for a pivotal. That's something that's, you know, affecting the whole industry now that the FDA is sort of 
putting us for them, but for them, it's not going to be manufacturing. It's how do you have a sort of a consistent product that you can put in front of the FDA. So that's one that I think there are a few more hurdles, but um, the idea that they keep trying to sell is that this is something because of the side effect profile you can bring really, really early. How do you run that study? Another question, but it's something that's so tantalizing that you feel like it's going to get explored at some point in, in a bigger way by them or, or by somebody else. I would just add, I think you're also maybe not as predominantly, but slowly in the background, see uh, large companies invest in cell therapy manufacturing, um, either directly like the artists through their own sort of camaraderie program or, or through, through acquisition. Um, just like Grace Hill, Spot Fashion, Zinica, part of that, I think, in my opinion, was that Grace Hill has a manufacturing facility in China. Um, maybe this depends on where Vivo Cartier goes, but, um, uh, but with, with data being good, in cell therapy. I mean, it's challenging. Now, obviously, there's been ups and downs in this whole category. But with data being good, it's, I think it's it's a modality that has to be considered when you're considering kind of all the different modalities for whatever target, whatever is your favorite target. So, any comments from the audience or at this point? Any any comments, questions, anything? Good. Thoughts about the rise or the call it resurgence in checkpoint ad, adjunct therapies that can be added on to a PD-1 or another immunomodulator. As we get a better understanding of what's happening in the tumor microenvironment, all the different cell types, inhibitory, activating, et cetera, it does seem like an area that maybe not this year, but in the next couple of years might come back. I guess that feeds it in part as to buy specific Michael as well, but also our thing. Coerts. Yeah, it's it's funny that that's been an ongoing theme for a decade. Um, and we're seeing some success. Um, yeah, I, I think I think it kind of comes down to two things. One, can you can you actually show something that's additive or synergistic without some tox profile? Well, I guess that's the you know, can you combine this from a tox perspective? You know, all the targeted therapies that we've had. Um, have just been challenging, I think, for the tox reason. And so finding the right molecule you can actually combine is is really the key. I would, you know, there's been, so specifically with the Kiraz, not at this meeting, but later this year, Kiraz data combination with Embryo. So that might be another thing, something to kind of look out for. Um, I think the another part of that that's sort of, I'd like to see more of are um, sort of the Pembro. CD3 or CD28 type things where you're, you know, like, especially on CD28, you need something to drive the T cells. Um, you know, it's something that, again, is the constant, like, small molecule or EDC, ever, but was, you know, there's, you know, a biologic rationale, but but hasn't been pursued yet yet. So looking forward to seeing more of that. Yet. I don't think we have much of it at ASCO, but over time we'll see more of it. I've just seen Paul with his hand up, and I wonder whether he's going to interject on the uh, on that point specifically. Yeah. Other, the, See the co stimulation sort of. Yeah, I, I, well, I, I, maybe I'll say a couple things. So, um, a comment about you were talking about different modalities being developed, right, to the same target. I just want to note that a, some of the, some of our larger pharma's are del- doing this deliberately. So J and J, for example, has cars to BCMA and GPRC five D. They also have bispecific engagers to those same targets. One of the reasons is, I think, shelf space. So if you look at the draft guidance, it's probably pre-draft guidance um, from ASH and then from the NCCN recently in hematology, they've got you know CAR-T coming in um, pretty high in the treatment paradigm, followed by bispecifics. So if you're J&J and you're looking at the indication and owning the indication, it makes sense to have both modalities, right, in your shop um, because you're talking to the same the same, same tumor board or the same clinician, um, practicing clinician for both of those therapeutics. And, and I, for, I, don't, I forget what you were talking about um, in between. It was something about post-stimulation, yeah? Yeah, just about the, the, the PD-1, for instance, with CD-28. Oh, right. Yeah, so... 
Yeah, so we, Rep. Brad and I talked about this this morning. I'm a little concerned about the proliferation of 401 BBA um, by specifics, not 40 by specifics. It doesn't strike me that they're always the most well thought out pairs. So the ones that really look to me like they're falling flat here at ASCO are PDL1 by 41 BB. You get some responses, but they're not very high. And you wonder, you know, would a PD1 alone have done that? Or would, you know, would you get a better result if the antibodies were separate instead of stuck together? And the reason I say that is that immunologically, it, do, it doesn't occur to me that 41 BB and PDL1 ought to be expressed at the same place at the same time in a functionally relevant manner. They may be there by immunohistochemistry or flow or what have you, but that doesn't mean you're going to engage 41 BB out there in space and expect it to do something immunologically relevant. I think what you probably do is, is kill the T cell, right? Because it's not in an immune microenvironment that's healthy for that cell. So there's a lot of examples like that. You've seen the CD28s kind of stumble, right? Regeneron had a whole stable full of these um, to go with their CD3s. And you could just imagine that someone somewhere thinks, hey, you know, if we could combine them, that would be really great. And it is a really great hypothesis. Um, and it's testable, which is, you know, even better. But the early results have not been outstanding. Right. So all these things take a lot of thought because immunology is a bear, you know, and you poke the bear and, and bad things happen. So I guess that fits in very nice with your earlier point, Brad, was, you know, is a biospecific strategy better than, you know, to think separately at all these other considerations. Right. Another couple of questions. Mm -hmm. Hi, Brad. A nice moderation and Jacob. First, and see you both moderate. <laughs> Actually, I can uh, have your lovely colleague Madeline join our webinar next uh, next week. So my question is really about the very specific uh, study you mentioned a little bit. It's uh, this uh, uh, PD-1 VEGF bi-specific. And uh, it was a uh, breaking news and understatement among the China biotech community. Uh, so, you know, uh, Kiso have a, quite a little bit the uh, um, interaction. And actually, the person, they have one study right now is being presented uh, and asked, and this give a moment. I don't know whether you are watching watching that up right now. So, in your view, obviously, uh, they have like a head to head compared to monotherapy of a pembro. That uh, probably would not cut it due to their endpoint BPFS in front line, um, non small cell lung cancer. So, in your opinion, why would you, uh, you sorry, why would you say in order to convince you this is gonna have some leg? For they become a serious uh, challenger for Pembro, which you know uh, everyone in PD1 IO space really want to like dethrone. So any comments that would be great. Thank you. So just to be clear: the study that's being presented at ASCO is the study on which they got through in time. Whereas the yeah, whereas the study that sent some mixed stock up was the head to head versus inferior. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So okay. Any, any comments? How do you how do you be true to what was uh what would convince you? I don't know. A bigger study, preferably an international one. Um I, I think that that's sort of gonna be end up being my bar. Um uh, you know, and, and I think a lot of people's do. I and this is not just from a, a you know, any statement about the particular study or the press release or anything. It's also just looking at the sort of the FDA's receptivity um, this kind of data, just a few examples where, um, you know, they really want to see that sort of, you know, larger study with, with a, a broader set of geographies. Um, so that, that'll be what I'll be looking for. And I, I, you know, again, given how exciting that would be to have something that could go head to head, deliver that kind of result, I'd be excited to see. I've not solicited investor feedback specifically for this program, but in general for long cancer for IO programs, it feels like Keynote 189 is kind of like the magic bar. So this is Pembro plus chemo, chemo double. Mm -hmm. um, now, I think some companies talk about, can you, can you go against Pembro monotherapy for pd one high patients? Because that's a common, you know, I think it's common for specialty centers to drop a chemo patients with pd ones Which I think is fair, but I think the other kind of side of that coin is, well, 
how many frontline patients PD-1 high are treated in specialty centers and are patients that get that same treatment with PD-1 high in the community, like by a community oncologist, are they willing to drop that chemo? And so what is truly the the bar? And I think there's nuances to both sides, but the clearest the clearest win, I think for most people, would be keto 1-8-I. I think yesterday's news brings up a bigger issue that um, that I think is worth thinking about since we're here at ASCO, and that's how fast Chinese companies are able to move. Um, so if you're in China, like if you want to run a cell therapy like investigator led study, you could do that very quickly. Whereas, you know, here you have to go through the IND process and everything. And I think you're starting to see some evidence of that speed um, like look at all the success like cell therapy and look at all of the in licensing that like large sophisticated companies like how many antibody drug conjugates has Merck in license you know from China for for example um, and so I think that's something that's worth thinking about um, I know this is something that like Carl June speaks a lot about in the cell therapy space specifically is uh, the contrast between the speed of being able to get in the clinic and being able to test things and see what works in the clinic and what doesn't and being able to pivot. And I know there's a lot of angles to the story, including ethical um, angles, but I think it's something that um, we should be thinking a lot more of. And it was what I immediately thought of when I saw that headline is how quickly companies could move. And I don't think it's, um, like the next key Truda, so to speak, absolutely could come from China. And, you know, I, I would love a, a next key Truda to come from anywhere, but um, I think especially for like a U.S. audience, we have to think, start thinking about this issue a lot more carefully because, you know, time goes fast and um, it'll be interesting to see the contrast of like how the different biotech sectors, the speed with which they move, but especially in early stage research, you know, start to learn what's working and what is it. I just had one one quick point to that. I think that's completely agree. There's a time, I think, when, you know, because the FDA is looking for U.S. patients, thinking about FDA approval and U.S. markets, I think investors really waited U.S. data. Um, but now we're seeing, I, I feel like we're seeing investors give credit to actually U.S. data, Chinese data, number of validations, from Chinese data translating U.S., um, the whole autoimmune craze, a, whole, a large proportion of the patient data we've seen from CAR T and autoimmune has come from patients that were not treated in the U.S. Investors seem to be willing to invest to that. So I, I think that's that's definitely a driven. Anyone else? Um, and just talking about another flip side of the problem, how do you create that sort of environment in the U.S.? I think one of the things to think about is how do you um, sort of create or allow for trials that, um, you know, go beyond this, the sort of traditional structure. You have an asset, you test it. So what do you think about like a sort of like a platform IND where, um, you know, I, I have a, someone I know at Slope Kettering where they have a huge library of sort of patient-derived DCR targets. What if you have a platform where you run cell therapies for a bunch of those as opposed to, you know, this is the one product that we're making. So like innovative trial design, innovative regulatory strategy, um, all with the aim of, of sort of prompting further innovation. You know, that's what it takes, really, is to, to you know think in different ways. Look forward to seeing that. Um, very quick last question or comment. Yeah, this is uh, addressing uh, Brad's uh, earlier question about uh, what the next modality will be that pharma will be hunting. Um, and as an investor uh, with a scientific background, who invest across all therapeutic indication, um, I, I think it's it's very nice to see that uh, those greatest successes in uh, oncology uh, still is very much science led and uh, is based on having a really good understanding of the modality. Uh, we have seen this uh, with the PARP inhibitors, with the ADCs. Uh, that you need to understand the problem first before you can really uh, make a huge success. So I think um, the next modality that will be hunted will be the same. Uh, so it could either be 
some of the modalities that have been mentioned here, or it could be other modalities that have shown an initial promise, um, later have uh, disappointed a little bit, but given people a chance to really understand why it fails, like oncolytic viruses. So uh, we, for instance, have lately made an investment in oncolytic viruses, but we are also very interested to hear about other modalities which people think they really understand and uh, can address. Uh, so um, yes, just please come forward with any uh, new modalities that you think that you really understand well. Um, and so, yeah, that was the answer to that. As well as, uh, I think, also an answer to your next question here uh, about uh, different regulatory settings. Uh, I think what really drives success is still a good understanding of the MOA. Right. Well, the ASCO post sessions await then. Right. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a great point, I think, to, to wrap up on. Mm-hmm.